Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Kwan Woo Kim, Dean of Arizona State University's Herberger Institute for Design and the Arts. Arizona State has been named one of America's best college buys by Forbes magazine and an up-and-comer by U.S. News and World Report. Kwan Woo Kim previously served as Herberger College of the Arts Dean and is president of the Longy School of Music in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and he's generously agreed to share some of his experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Kwan Woo, for joining us today. Thank you. It's great to be here. So this is a very interesting time in, in your school yes. and in ASU's evolution, Absolutely. having just completed a, a merger. Talk about the process of merging two schools within sure. the, the ASU umbrella. Well, you know, all, basically all across the country, particularly the year 2008, 2009, was a very challenging year financially, I think, for most public institutions. Um, many places around the country took the approach of just reducing. Arizona State University was quite a bit, uh, took a very different approach, really to do some very large reorganizations, which, which helped to capture uh, some of the key uh, key visionary pieces of the university. So I think the the idea of combining arts and design, taking two colleges was really to to promote the idea of the importance of the arts, of creative activity, creative thought in this large research university. Uh, it sounded relatively easy on paper. The challenge, of course, of taking two large institutions and combining them is very often the fact that you're you're talking about institutions that have developed their own very unique cultures, and trying to merge cultures is very challenging. So I find the, found the process was one of first getting a clear sense of how those cultures were different, different, and then thinking about ways in which looking for the connections and building on those connections. And that was a you know, a process of experimentation. I have to give a lot of credit to our faculty who are very patient and very open to this experience. But even more important than that to me was the idea that if we successfully achieved the merger but did not promote the idea of looking for the opportunity inherent in the merger, we wouldn't have, we'd have accomplished nothing. It would have just been an administrative move. So this was not, although there were some real financial um, realities Absolutely. that you faced. This was not about a downsizing uh, philosophy. No, this was I'm really not. about positioning yourself for the future and for expansion. That's how I see it, Mark. I mean, what happened as a result of the merger was um, the creative disciplines at the university acquired a much larger footprint. So I think everyone who works in universities knows that size does matter, that you have a different voice, a different access to the table. So this was very important to us, and it was up to us within now this new institute to determine what were the opportunities that the university had made available to us. So I've stayed focused for the last number of years now, since we've been in existence for three years almost, um, looking for what we're calling the meta-level connections across these various disciplines. Since we have all of the arts, performing arts, school of art itself, we have connection to digital media, we now have architecture and design. And our first big push in all of this was to design and create a new curriculum in digital culture, which seemed like it was in some ways neutral enough that no one school could claim ownership, and yet it, it felt like it, it contained some of the aspirations of all of our schools. Because basically we, we have as our primary mission the idea of answering the question, how does an education in the arts help to prepare a young person for success in their futures? not necessarily only in a future that is very much uh, on a one-to-one -one relationship between a degree and a career, but what's that bigger picture look like? How does learning the arts, studying the arts, really prepare you for success in life? Uh, simultaneously, we found a lot of students were saying to us that they were interested in a career in digital media, in companies like Google or Facebook or Pixar. Or, um, what we realized is there is no career path to those, to those there, kinds there of There is companies. absolutely no, and people are fooling themselves if they think that, that just prescriptively studying the STEM disciplines no. or, or, or a, a sort of a narrow um, uh, uh, cut into software engineering, that that's going to actually... It's a tiny piece. It's a tiny piece. But what we decided to ask the question, we I was able to gather together, this was perhaps the 
the most important piece. We pull together faculty from 15 different academic units at the university, including all of our schools, but schools, electrical engineering, computer science, mathematics, English, you name it. And we, we pulled faculty together and asked the question, if a young person wants a career in a field which is still emerging, what do you think the key proficiencies and skills and knowledge bases are? And they worked diligently to sort of build this curriculum from ground up. I was able to secure a very large gift, so there was some financial incentive. There's two other things about this that I think are important. One, the creation of this particular curriculum was very much driven by student interest. Sometimes what happens in universities is curricular conversations take place within a hermetically sealed environment where it's really faculty speaking to each other. And the students are, are out. And the students receive the byproduct. Right. Um, we started with the question of how are we going to answer this student need and then the other piece that's important as well you cannot create a curriculum around an emerging industry without industry participation so we also have advisors directly from various corporations and companies in this area who are talking to us about what they hope young people who are getting this degree are going to be prepared to do so there is a loop of uh, knowledge which keeps enriching what we're doing otherwise it would be just another standalone, perhaps slightly dry academic product, which is really not what this is about. Uh, long story short, we did it. We um, created and received approval for a new degree in digital culture. I convinced the university to give me a building that had become vacated and for them to put a lot of money into rehabbing it for us. So we have a new curriculum in a new space. We have a very large number of majors. The degree has just been online for about a year and we already have I think 150 majors this fall, and it's very exciting because it's, it, it's pushed the arts into a very different conversation at the university because a lot of people ask the question, why is this coming out of your institute? Why is this not coming out of computer science or engineering? And the answer is, well, first of all, we, did, we chose to do it, but also practitioners in our areas understand something very deeply about what it means to be, to, what it means for a project to be engaging. And we found that so far, early, early into this project, we're, we're seeing huge success and huge interest. And that's the kind of project that we are trying to define ourselves through, as not just being those people who make objects or do things that people may or may not care about, but who are really involved in this process of thinking about the future of education. So, in a sense, while it might be happening in your office. It's mm -hmm. actually, uh, these are ideas that are, that are owned far more broadly than just by your office. And oh, so yes. you also have a political aspect of understanding that it's not just the good idea, it's the process to getting to the good idea. True collaboration emanates from confidence. So if you're confident in the quality of the idea and confident in your ability to make it happen, then you should be also confident about opening it up and you know finding out what other people have to say. And I have, the real politic part of this as well, Mark, is very often faculty members in universities are asked to do more without any more. Right. And that's not a good way to work when possible. So you know, for my, my job really was to get out, go out there and find the resource. Find the funding. You know, I don't pretend that I'm the expert in this area. I don't have to be the expert. I gathered experts. Together. So are you both leading, mm -hmm. but are you also working in service to the faculty oh, absolutely. who you are also asking to lead? Absolutely. The faculty are the experts in this area. And I think a key, a key piece of academic leadership is understanding where expertise is and who is expert at what, and not pretending to be expert at something that you're not. I mean, I think that's really important. So um, I knew this wasn't going to work if there wasn't some actual financial incentive. And that transformed the conversation. Now, I will say one thing that was an important moment for me. Before I had the gift secured, I made the promise to the faculty. Um, because I realized we had come to a, a moment where people were beginning to question whether this work was really going to lead to anything. And so I had to stick my neck out and just say, this is going to happen. I'm guaranteeing this is going to happen. And then I had to scramble to make it happen. But uh, fortunately, it was meant to be because it did happen. Well, sometimes there's a dialogue between um, reality and aspiration yeah. that, that, that takes place, and you, you, you create the aspiration, and then you make it happen. Take some risk, right? Let's talk a bit about scale. Sure. Um, sure. Number, number of students, um, 
budget yep. um, and, and, and the full scope of, of uh, faculty and, and the responsibilities that come under this umbrella. But you know, Arizona State currently is the largest public university in the country. Yes. I think our under, undergraduate student population is something like 55, 57,000 students. We have about 4,000 undergrads and about 900 graduate students. Uh, I have about 225 full-time faculty and then another 150 part-time faculty. Uh, we operate on a budget of about $48 million and then have access to a number of endowment accounts, but that's the sort of core budget. Uh, a staff of about 140. We're, we're quite dispersed, so we, we're in about 33 buildings on four different campuses, so we're kind of right. a little bit all over the place. Each of the six schools plus the museum, so there's seven directors of right. each of those units, and then I have on the administrative side about six or seven senior staff just as an example, one person who handles all academic personnel issues, one person who does all curricular and student issues, one person who handles, handles finance and administration and HR. They're big jobs for people because, as you can imagine, um, we don't have the resource to be richly staffed. Right. So people really have to make do. But it's, it's quite extraordinary, I think, the, the level of dedication. I like to think it's because we're in a university that's completely driven by vision, and then we're in a part of the university, the Herbert Institute, that that also has a real clear sense of vision. I think that's what keeps people motivated, and you know, I don't want to only rely on that, of course, but um, we're fortunate to have that commitment. You did refer to the right. fact that you had the two schools, the, the, the two different cultures, you had two different student bodies. You're now trying to rationalize mm -hmm. uh, across lines to create the savings so that you can take those savings and make that into investment capital. How does the culture play into that? The key piece about looking at, at cultures which are different and finding ways to bring them together, I think it has to do a lot to do with, first of all, paying attention, a lot of listening. And, you know, even when you have a plan, when you realize, okay, I just have to slow down on this, you have to slow down sometimes. I mean, that's difficult at a university like Arizona State, but sometimes the most prudent choice is just to slow down and let things take a little more time. And so that's, you, you've sometimes been in, in full throttle and then you, you, oh, absolutely. you've had your come up in sometimes? Absolutely. And just you back off, you readjust, you try it again. Um, actually, I have found that that builds loyalty. When people see that the person in charge is willing to recalibrate and respond to input, people get on board more quickly. So that's, that's, a, that's working with the faculty. Now with the students, what was important to me, I wanted this to be seamless for the students. I didn't want them to get involved at all in the idea that oh, there's this big change. So we tried to keep them very focused on, you know, your faculty are the same faculty, your programs are the same programs. And that's where we were at the beginning. Right. But that was enough because they needed to be in a safe space. Over time, what we've introduced is much more the conversation of, now look at all these new opportunities that you have. We have tried to stay focused on this question. You know, the question of how does what we teach our students prepare them for their futures? And what I challenge our faculty with is saying, you know, obviously we would love to be able to guarantee that every one of our students will complete their education and go straight into a job. And we'll do the best we can to help. But we can't make that promise. That would be a dishonest thing to do. But at the same time, we also know that the current statistics are that for young people graduating from, from university today, most of these young people are going to experience somewhere between five to eight really different careers in their lifetimes. Right. So my question to the faculty is, how is what we are teaching our students preparing our students for career number six and career number seven? Are they learning anything while they're with us that's going to have a positive impact on their success at that stage of their careers? So what we're trying to do is open up the conversation about what it means to be providing education in creative disciplines. So that it's, yes, some of it is professional education, but there has to be a lot more than that. Because if we're only training students for careers, we're really preparing them for the past. And that, I don't believe in that. Are we preparing students for change? Hopefully we are. I'll give you an example. We are increasingly aware, or at least increasingly able to articulate, that our students uh, acquire very, very complex skills above and beyond what they think they're learning. So as a specific example, students who study art become very comfortable and very fluent dealing with ambiguity. Now, 
you talk to business leaders and they get very excited about that when they hear this. What our obligation then is to be able to really show them how we know it's true. What does that process look like of teaching a young person to be comfortable with ambiguity and what can they do with that? But we are just at the stage now because I think we finally have a, set, a cohesive sense of we are the Herberger Institute. Yes, we have six schools, each of which is very different, but we have this common purpose. Uh, so we are in the, in the process now of building our list of these extra skills. And then we're also exploring how they can be transferable. So if, if you're an art student and you're comfortable with the idea of you walk into a space and it's empty and you have to decide what to do, which is really the ultimate experience of ambiguity. Or in walking ways. into a market and the product, there's no product there. Right, but can you make that transference? And that's exactly where we are right now educationally. We're trying to think of what does that process look like to first help the student articulate mm -hmm. that ability and then understand that if you can do it in that space, right. you probably can do it in another space. So this is our current kind of pedagogical exploration. And in the business world, if you're in packaging, mm -hmm. packaging is an art. If you're in sure. building, architecture and design is so important. Mm -hmm. If you are trying to communicate the value of your product, how you communicate that artistic sense to create a brief image or message is, is so important. It all comes down to that sort of creative impulse and the ability to adapt in real time that you're and talking about. In response to your question about change, my question is always, how will anything change? if the young people that we send out into the world think and do things the same way that everybody else does. And one of the huge advantages that I think students who are studying the arts and the other creative disciplines have is they live in a space where they're constantly thinking about doing things a different way. And again, if we can help them to understand and you can apply that in other ways, they, they go out into the world sort of primed and really isn't that what this country change. needs? I think so. We need to reinvent ourselves if we are going to remain the America that we have always been. Absolutely. You know, many of the most progressive companies in this country have artists and designers on their core teams. Companies at very high like levels. Apple. Microsoft. I mean, it's, you know, it's very, I just met the, the Microsoft's chief anthropologist. I mean, it's very interesting the kinds of people that are in these teams because there is a recognition that unless you bring in people with profoundly different perspectives on, on, on the way the world works and how the world could be, you don't get to change, you don't get to positive change, you, you replicate, which is of course not what we need. Well, you see that also in biotechnology, you see that in, in, uh, in manufacturing, you see the creatives out there that distinguish themselves and they're distinguishing themselves because they are doing things differently, they're taking risks. Yeah. Well, there's a hard-edged element to the education process today because we do have high levels of unemployment. Yes. If the economy is going to shift, it's going to shift through the engagement of people uh, like yourself, like your faculty, in helping students to not only equip themselves to make a contribution, but to equip students to shift the reality of our future. Yes. It gets increasingly serious as a student goes from freshman to sophomore to junior and, and, um, and toward graduation and toward additional education. Um, how does the Institute help students in that, in that process as they near graduation, as they're more concerned about uh, gaining independence through a job and so on? So you know, we have some traditional mechanisms in place, some you know, career counseling. We have those kinds of pieces in place, and it's fairly robust. I know our, at a more informal level, our faculty are deeply, deeply engaged with our students in terms of professional advising. Um, but what I'm trying to create now is another layer of that sort of career counseling, which is a little bit more life counseling and not so much career oriented. Again, I feel like the faculty have the, the best ability to help a young person understand what a specific career path might look like. Right. So we're, we're bringing in increasingly um, guest speakers whose lives model the idea of life as a crooked path. Yes. And really helping young people to see that you might be surprised how I got here. I spend a lot of our time with our students talking about, because many of them imagine I somehow just decided one day I wanted to be a dean, and they really need to understand that this was never 
part of my thinking. Never. And it's interesting to see how surprised they are. You know, just hearing me talk for 30 minutes about, particularly hearing about the things that didn't work in my life. So I'm, I think this is actually perhaps even more important, or at least as important as a sort of traditional career counseling approach, for students to really hear about people's lives, people who are doing something that they are interested in or admire. Because of course, it's never a straight path. And that, the crooked path idea is very important to me because I want students to honor that and, and feel good about that, not see it as a sign of failure. Because very often, students who start with a degree in the arts, very often, just the reality of the world, may take a little bit longer to get where they're going to go eventually. And that's OK. On the one hand, you have the faculty who are dealing with the cultural changes and the, the difference in terms of how administration works and, and how schools are organized. How have students experience this? And, and how do you know how, how students feel? Because it's, it's sometimes rather opaque. The way I gauge student, student sort of well-being, and this is something I'm really pleased about, I have made a real deep commitment to lots and lots of interaction with students. So basically every week I interact with students. I hold, you know, I have meals with students, I have meetings, I go to, you know, I create receptions. Usually with just the agenda of, he of hearing from what's hearing directly from students. And that's really been very, it's been extraordinarily helpful to me because it makes it feel real to me. But I'm finding students tell me it's very, I love our students. They're so cute. They, you know, I had some students say to me recently, you know, you know, Dean, we were telling some of our friends in another college, we, we get to see the Dean, and they're saying, what? So, I mean, it, it's, there's a real culture, I think, in Herberger now that the Dean is available to the students. Uh, the single greatest compliment I've received from a faculty, not to my face, but came back to me. One faculty member who didn't know me prior to the merger said to another faculty member, you know, it's really nice having a Dean who's so student-centric. That means a lot to me. That's the only reason I'm doing this. Um, I'm deeply, deeply committed to the idea that through higher education, I mean through the whole process of education, but in my world, through higher education, we are, we've entered into and must fulfill, uh, it's a contract that we enter into with, with our students. And we've got to fulfill the promise that we're making to them that somehow as a result of this experience and this learning, they are better equipped to succeed in the, in the world. In the world. That's, that's what drives me. So it's nice to, and it's nice to see how those words are becoming the words that I'm hearing out of many people's mouths. What does the future hold for the Institute and, and how it fits in the university? You, you, you've been in the post-merger yes. uh, stage for the, for the last three years. And it seems that at, at this point, you've, you've gotten past the initial hump mm -hmm. of, of the transformation. And now you're, you're positioned for a future. What is that future going to look like? I think that starting now with the, the digital culture degree, we are looking for the next series of those high-level projects, possible degrees, programs that link the institute. Um, so one of them is definitely going to be something in the area of community engagement work. We already do a great deal of community engagement across the Institute, but it's, it's dispersed. It's not, it's not focused, it's not clearly defined. And I would like to see, one of my aspirations, which may or may not happen, is to bring deep engagement work with community into, into the curriculum. Because I also think it's an essential component of student learning. So when you're talking about community, you're talking about the community around the schools? Yes, both local and beyond. Um, another potential piece is at this stage very conceptual, but we have emanating from our museum a project called the Desert Initiative, uh, which is currently more about thinking about the desert from an aesthetic perspective. But if we can broaden it to reach out to the university, which is very focused on sustainability issues, mm -hmm. and develop an initiative that is both aesthetic and scientific, and again comes back into curriculum, and helps us to link more deeply to the place where we are, that's another piece, I think, that could become a defining characteristic of the Institute. And then the fourth piece for me has to do with the topic of human wellness. Arizona State University does not have a medical school, but is, has a deep partnership with the Mayo Clinic and is engaged in some large research projects around childhood obesity and broader conversations around 
health versus health care. And I have been very aggressive about promoting the idea of the arts as a component in the conversation about human wellness, about health. We actually have programs in music therapy in the Institute. We actually have a degree in um, healthcare environment design. So I'm very ambitious for that to, to come up to the surface because I think it would help us to talk about what we do from a different perspective that is also very real. So I'm looking for those large, large pieces. Obviously, we'd like to become um, much better endowed than we are, so there's a constant push to get out there and, and raise funds. Um, and I'm pushing the school directors to increasingly move their schools on a path of differentiated excellence. So I really want to always understand how is this school excellent, not just in a very standard way, but in a way that sets it apart, because I think that that's one of our obligations. So that over time, the students that come to us are more self-selecting. Yes. They're coming to this school because it does something different, and that's what they because want. Because it is ASU, it is in, in Phoenix, it is in, well, in the various campuses that you have scattered mm -hmm. throughout mm -hmm. the, the region. It's, it's so interesting to me that you are taking the idea of ASU as an economic and social force here and thinking about topics like sustainability, like the desert landscape in which, yeah. in which we operate, like the future of the country and the region and the students and taking these very large topics and incorporating them into an institute for design and the arts in a way that cross-fertilizes with other parts of the community and, and the school. It, these are such wonderful ideas and I, I'm so appreciative, appreciative for your insights and for sharing them with us today. Thank, well, thank you. Thank you. It's been a great pleasure, Mark. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much, Paul.